Okay. Um, first, was there anything um, from last week that anybody who was thinking about our week or that they didn't get to say last week that anybody wanted to bring up? Last week was, does it matter how I did? What I do doesn't say to me, does it matter how I did? Yeah, if there was anything, anybody, but if not, um, I'll, I'll pray us in. Um, loving God, we praise you for the countless blessings that we experience daily. Words cannot describe the riches you have given us, and yet we also experience suffering. As we struggle for answers, help us to remain faithful in our journey. We praise you for never ending presence in our lives. We also reach out from our experiences of, and suffering and ask, where are you, God? With both boldness and confusion, we pray. Amen. I like that and confusion. <laughs> yeah. So, um, if you want to look at the picture here, um, if anybody thinks about this cross or another cross, uh, and wants to reflect on that and uh, and or think of something that gave you hope uh, in the midst of suffering or a difficult time. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. I could share something. Well, you can think of, um, I have this cross that the campus pastor um, at my undergrad gave me. It's a small metal cross, and it was actually during World War II, um, someone had it in Hungary during the um, occupation, and there, there was a Jewish man who happened to have this cross and the SS soldier came to like arrest them to you know, bring him to a concentration camp and he just like showed the the cross to him and that the SS was like okay you're not Jewish and he like moved on so it was um, the, the cross actively you know saved saved this Jewish man's life so mm-hmm. Thinking about that, it's 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 always something that I think about in the midst of hope, and the mm-hmm. you know the saving act of the cross was really embodied in that. Was, was he a Jewish turned Christian? No, he was just a Jewish man that had yeah, kind of placing his best half and half. Yeah. Or he had a cross in his house. Yeah, it, it is a small like you know you would kind of wear like a, a metal yeah. Oh yeah. That's really cool, but yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I think when, um, you don't realize how beautiful our sanctuary is, because, you know, it's church and you're busy and you're doing all this stuff, and when we did spiritual yoga here a couple of years ago, we would have the lights down low, and sometimes they had these little votive candles like, and you would just, you know, I mean, I'd be doing my yoga or you'd just be sitting there looking and it was just very special place to be. It was really nice just looking. Our church is so classical the church. It just is yeah. the whole like, upside down boat, the whole. When we moved here, I thought, oh, I didn't see Haley walking up that aisle and get married, but she <laughs> None of my kids got married here either. And they went to church here in India or whole life. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, you think it is really pretty and all the stained glass and everything. And then sometimes I'm just like, oh, you know, we talk about there's so many of these in churches in Marty and mine and I were walking the day and we're like, yeah, you know, this is valuable property. If they turn this all down, they can put a, you know, and all that. And but then you're like, it's hard not to hang on to these symbols of, you know, where your faith is and where you kind of grew. Yeah. Space map, you know. Space is mm-hmm. yeah. significance. I, 
think are still, I mean, in my mind, I gotta say it, there still is a, a warning that you don't want to worship the created. And this is created. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. right. So, you know, it's just like if your house burns down, but your whole family's alive. Yeah, you're, you know? you're sad, you're happy, what are you, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think the steeple is like the perfect example of this. It's people love it and all these things, but it's not, that's not what makes St. Paul St. Paul. It's, it's kind of a nice thing and it draws you to it. You do know it came down last week. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's that's working. When we were here, they were throwing stuff down. They were still working. Yeah, right? yeah. That's my point. It's a, it was taken down and like nothing, nothing mm-hmm. has yeah. changed about the ministry of St. Yeah. Paul. If it, it's something like things in the sanctuary, like it's, it's a very nice thing. It, it, it can draw you in certain ways, but it's not, Taking it down, I don't think. And knock on wood somewhere. I know the pastor said last night that, you know, there there was a number of people in the church that were very adamant, and like, don't take my yeah. steeple. Mm-hmm. Nothing's been said. Nothing's been negatively commented back at him yet. I hope he stays that way, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. Does anybody else have other reflections or can read the passage? Um, so if we want to read it. I forgot my readers, I can't read. (laughs) I can read. We can start with the NRSV. I should see what my inspire is. Oh, this is a fresh item. What what chapter are we doing? It's eight, uh, it starts with verse 18. So we can all write on a page. So we can accident. I can I, split it. Right. Oh, you got it. Yeah, I got it. So we can split it in half. One person wants it. All right. The first Up section to, to 30. Okay, I'll do to 30. Future glory. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits for eager longing. Wait, is that right? For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. She thanks Paul. So long sentence. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our body. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Somebody want to read the next part, sir? Sure, we're at 30, 31. Yeah, okay. so back to the Christ, uh, God's love in Christ Jesus. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is 
Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress, persecution or famine or nakedness, or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now I get the last one. That's a hell of a sentence. I get that one. But some of these other ones. Yeah. I never I never understood that. Word. If God is for us, oh, who is against I think us? Is Grace on there? Yeah. Oh, hi, Grace. Hey there. I'm just going to turn on my video briefly, but <laughs> I'm not at my very best right now. I'm kind of a fly on the wall. Okay. Um, I may say a few things, but one. Forgive me if I have to cut out. I'm actually working on several things at once. And some of you may know I had a lot of hardware removed from my back recently and more inserted. So I'm still on lots of pain medications and stuff like that. So <laughs> oh, we're glad you're, I hope you're getting better. Yeah, we hope you're doing well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. I, I especially, I mean, I love, uh, Romans eight nineteen to 22, that's actually one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It's up there with the first chapter of John and some hints in Isaiah um, that it's not just human beings that are to be redeemed, but in some sense, the entire um, creation, which is currently characterized by death and decay, at some point is to be transformed into something else. I love that. I love that. People talk about the cosmic Christ, mm -hmm. about Christ coming, not just for us, but for the salvation of everything. Anyway, I just thought I'd say that while I'm still here and while I have the energy to say it. Thank you. Good Thank you. Thank you. Didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no. no, no, not interrupt you. Yeah. Um. So we can, I don't know if you guys want to read other translations or just bring them in as if you feel the need to, we can, you know. We have other well, I'm confused by that, um, like 28 up there with all the, um, so maybe what does, the, do you have a, another? I think another translation is good. To me, the interesting thing in there is the word predestined multiple times. Yeah, yeah. so then I was That's wondering, very, like, very do you believe that, you know, like, I have some friends that believe, you know, that God just plans when you're going to die and your time's up and that's it and it's all predestined. I don't know if I really I don't buy into that. I mean... There's no answer, man. The church has been fighting that one for many years. Yeah. <laughs> but is that what Paul's meaning by this? I have the message if we want. Oh, yeah. What's the message? That, okay. I got 28 to 30. The 28 part. All right. So 28 starts with, let me see if I can find it because he doesn't. Uh, we know that all things. Okay. Well, I'm going to start with 26 just because it's easier. Yeah. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's spirit is right alongside helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. God does our, or the Spirit does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. God knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. God knew what God was doing from the very beginning. God decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love God along the same lines as the life of God's Son. The Son stands first in the line of humanity, God restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in Him. After God made that decision of what God's children should be like, God followed it up by calling people by name. 
And he went, oh no, still going. And God called them by name. God set them on a solid basis with God's self. And then after getting them established, God stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what God had begun. Oh, wow, that's really, I couldn't even follow along where you were. That's much better now. Yeah. What, uh, what translation is that? That's the message. So what, what is, were you saying? The oh, what is sir, um, it's from uh, Eugene Peterson. Oh, the message. Okay. Eugene Peterson. Gail, 31, when it says, I mean, do they have numbers in what you read in the message? Yeah, they do, but What's they don't have. But 31 said? would be, so what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? Okay. And then it keeps going with. So that made sense with the firstborn and that Jesus was from the message I got that part. But the predestination part is still there, just not couched as much as in like theological language. They don't use the word predestination. But God knew, he, God knew what was coming. And something like that. that. And that verse 26 with the Spirit and praying for us and all that, I, I mean, that's pretty popular. And the way the message kind of explains it is not probably what we think of in terms of predestination. It's like God knew what God wanted for the people, and that was to follow Christ or to be like Christ. And so anyone who loves God then will be then God's plan for you is that you're going to be like Christ. But then, so, okay, so... Not necessarily that God picked you and said, I know that you're going to choose to love me. But he wants you to be like Christ. But yeah. when creation started, is that why Jesus came down? Because he knew what he was doing and he predestined everybody and then it wasn't working out well. So then he decided, okay, now I'm sending Jesus down or was Jesus predestined? and said we're going to let the people live for a while, and then, and this year, I'm setting it down. What do you think? Is that all part of the plan? Why didn't Jesus just come at the beginning? Well, because uh, the thing was perfect, and right? According to this. To the but not that long. Account. It was Well, perfect. we don't know how long it really was. Well, I mean, right back to Noah, that people sucked. I mean. I mean. <laughs> I'm just covering my views with words, but. Well. <laughs> Well, in reality, well, yeah, just choice. because yeah. Jesus came around, but she was not to love God. But it's interesting that Jesus was foretold thousands of years before he got here. And the firstborn of everything. So it seems so, like that was kind of predestined to happen. I mean, you know. But when were those passages interpreted as such? The meanings of those passages, because when the scriptures were written, they weren't, I mean, it wasn't laid totally out. And then when did we begin? to see that some of those passages might foretell the coming of Jesus. I mean, and those were all interpreted retroactively. Yep. Mm -hmm. too, so you always have to be careful with that. But it's retroactive. Because that's not saying it was written. It, it may have been written in full light of, of the Spirit, but our interpretation certainly was many, 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 many years later, I, I would think. Like, by a couple of people, a couple so. of people got it, but and it couldn't. I didn't. There are like examples, like the um, where it spoke <laughs> to. It was about the context, the immediate context, but also foretelling something. Like Isaiah, the the foretelling of Jesus. Right, the whole, the, that's also there was. Um, you know, somebody born in his time in, um, in the royalty there. That that was about like that. That was true in I, Isaiah's context, but it's also true about Jesus. Like that, you there are examples of that happening when it's not just. Well, it gets to what we, and it gets to what we read in terms of the Christmas story. Yeah and how those same words are being used to describe not just the empire, but now this tiny... And the whole, the like that one ad yeah. that we went back through the whole lineage of Jesus all the way through from the beginning. So if you're doing that, then it does seem like it's a predestined 
thing that that was the original plan and it wasn't just like now what do we do? Well, it would depend on when and why you were doing it. So, you know, why, why were they doing the genealogy? I mean, even in what we read, it talked about how they tweaked the okay. genealogy to end at certain place or to emphasize certain things, like the women were emphasized in one. And I'm not, and right, I'm just right, right, throwing no. ideas out. I'm not. Yeah, it was, so. you know, yeah, like the book we read this advent, it, yeah. it discussed that. The, they're, they were more theological than a literal, genealogy. you know, to trace like that. Like, like your DNA. Yeah. Or yeah. yeah. But it's showing the yeah. coming of that. But what, what I was just saying, I mean, I, cause I heard this group just saying it tonight. Um, when you say predestined, if God said, you know, here we are, we're largely sinful, but I want you all to be decent people and loving people. Christ and saved, is that what predestined is, or is predestined saying you, not you? Oh, and, you know, what is it saying? Yeah, I, I think it depends on how you think of it. Yeah. Think the theology of it, that's that's what it's associated with. Calvin. Yeah. 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 That's what that's most associated with Calvin. It's why you're where some people are predestined for salvation, some right. aren't. Right. Um, but I mean, it's it's an open question of, of e what you think Paul is. Enoch was hated, you know. Well, the, the other thing I think that is problematic with that interpretation of predestination is how free will plays into that. Because of predestination in the sense that everybody's been already slated one way or another, free will goes out the window. And I think that a lot of us can't accept that, would have to believe that free will is not an illusion, it's real, and our choices are real, and we do have power over, to some extent, our own destinies. Obviously, we don't have power over when we're born and die and things like that, but... Is free will scriptural at all? Free will. Free will. Free, will. Free, will. Yeah. free will, yes. It's mixed up a couple of things. I would say that, like, the idea of anytime you're doing an act or doing, I mean, you're, um, like, with Cain and Abel, they were each on their own came with an offering to God. I mean, it's not, like, it's not necessarily as developed as later, like, sort of philosophers and theologians would debate and stuff. That's like kind of my, the way I would sort of read things. Um, and John Calvin kind of gets this because of he, he's trying to hold these things, different things. Like he said, God has to be in control because God is this totally other thing. That's like his conception. I mean, you can make the assumption, <laughs> okay, you got Cain and Abel. Well, Cain was predestined to be a bad guy, or, you know, and, and uh, Abel was, was destined to be a good guy. Okay. Or you can say they had free will and there was a different meaning altogether for predestined. I still don't know which is which. But. Yeah. And there are some persons, they might be in the minority, who are literally studying whether, researching whether or not humans actually have free will and have come to understand that no, we don't have any yeah, free will. Yeah. Whatever yeah. my wife says, you know, so, yeah. and I, you know, I tried reading through the whole thing, but I'm not sure, you know, I haven't spent any time with it. But there are some who that's what they're, yeah, and totally how they explain it. Which is interesting. So, what does that mean then for all of us? Maybe that. Uh, just really quickly, one of you is is kind of off screen for me. Um, sitting next to Brian, I was going to say, I assume that's Gail. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Come on over. Come over. It, it, it's okay. It, it, it's okay. Don't rearrange for my sake. But there are six of you in the room there right now. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wait for okay. Thank you. You see me? Thank you. <laughs> no, I just wait. I right? see you. Where am I? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I can see you. Well, yeah, I, I I'm here too. I'm just not. Now you're big. I can't see. <laughs> yeah. I I just I just like to stay off camera. <laughs> right. Yeah. You all are way. Oh, too far away. Uh, it's just interesting. Yeah. What do they ask? But it may, but the predestination though, depending on how some purists it, I mean, it makes it a very non-loving God in my mind. 
because if God intends for all of us to be with God, then how can one say that God predestined us, maybe, and then how do you know you were predestined? That's the other piece that sometimes comes up, is you think you've been predestined. <laughs> But you don't. Oops. But you don't really know, even though you're doing what you, you know you believe and you think, well, and you mean you don't. You yourself you may not you've know. Been predestined to heaven. Right. But nobody like. But, but you don't know. Right. Like John Calvin famously was very. He was unsure of his own. Like he's yes. espousing this view and doing these things, and you're not sure of you know. You're 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 never sure of you never like you don't have this feeling of like. God telling you you're a beloved child of God, like some are yeah. and some aren't. Uh, and John Wesley famously said that the God of John Calvin is like worse than Satan because in that view, God is like damning so many people right. to, to hell. Yeah. Um, well, and you think just in our baptism liturgy, when maybe it's that time, we welcome you into God's family. And, and then Jerry wrote that nice little book and, you know, you're loved and you're, you know what I mean? So that doesn't go along with any of that. It's, yeah. it's not like, it doesn't say in there, and by the way, we hope you're one of the predestined ones. That yeah. <laughs> one of my favorite scriptures is always when I, you know, get, we talk about uh, Pharaoh back in those days, and you know, and we all know those stories, and this happened and that happened. And I mean, Pharaoh, I don't think, was baptized, but I mean, he had his, I'm sure his mother loved him, and I'm sure his mother said, you know, you're gonna be okay, and things like that. And, and at the end of the whole thing, God says, I put this whole thing into place to show the people that I am God. And you're just like, whoa, what a chess game he's, you know. Yeah. That whole story. I am God. That's the purpose for your whole civilization. Uh, you know, that sounds pretty heavy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It would be interesting to know what the original words are, not the yeah. English translation of yeah. these words. So, but anyway. What, um, <laughs> so. what does everyone think of the use of suffering in this? Oh. In this passage, like when Paul is talking about suffering, the sufferings of this present time, you know, verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. Well, I think mean, Paul, to me, Paul, Paul was the leader of the suffering, uh, the sufferers. I mean, that's uh, the giver of suffering. <laughs> Yeah. You know, Paul went off and, and killed or or yeah, caused the killing of many, 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 many people. Mm -hmm. And now he's on that side. And we're still, you know, it's not like Paul ended all his stuff. They're still getting killed and wiped out left and right. So that certainly had to have been. There's reasons they met in secret places. There's, there's you know, reasons they had the symbol of the fish. Yeah. Um, you know, this is all some secret little society here. You you let your identity know, and you're you're you're. All <laughs> I thought the question so under that first part, that historical context, the first one about it. You know, is he talking about what's going on on a systemic level, or is he talking about the everyday stuff that we go through, like grief and and things? And then I was somewhat surprised a little bit, even though you know, I, I guess it's the way it's presented. And number two, and it says. It wasn't an ever-present, widespread threat in the early church, but martyrdom was, there's ample evidence, and sporadic persecution, whereas when we often it's presented, think of that time, it's that they're continually being persecuted. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just found that, you know, that, that was just an interesting wake up maybe or you know maybe it's the way we present it learn it was that quoted somewhere is that, is that it's, it's, no, it's just in the, it's in the learners learners book and um but it says persecution wasn't ever present where do they get that up where, where that's a wasn't statement. Where, an ever present widespread threat but there was a present widespread where are they where are they getting the, the where are they getting the information to yeah. say this i don't know what, where, what where, it brings to mind is that when you read the very earliest letters post New Testament you have the letter of Polycarp who was 
through the lineages um, of John and Justin Martyr and Ignatius of Antioch. These are there's even the people. Some people thought like Ignatius was so early, like his letters could have been in the New Testament. But you have accounts of, and a lot of them they're martyred. Um, you know, Justin Martyr. That's that's that, that's where the name came from. And oh. they. Many of them, you have them pr imprisoned, and the Romans are sort of just recant your faith. We'll let you out. We'll recant your faith. And you have other Christians who come to see them and just say, just, just recant. Like you'll live to go on another day. And they, um, and these accounts, they do, they hold firm to their faith and. That's when they're martyred. So it, that's what this makes you think of. Is that like, yes, martyrdoms were happening. There were persecutions. Yeah, um, they would give this sort of an out in in this way, but it was it was happening. But it doesn't sound like they were going door to door as. A few hundred years later, in the Crusades, etc., we they are going <laughs> to part yeah. the bar and getting people, you know, in terms of persecution. So, but, but but even after so. Christ died, the eleven are are or ten, I guess, are are in a locked room when Jesus well, yeah, well, died. Well, afraid too. Room. But well, if your social political leader just was killed, I'd be scared too. I'd be in a locked room. Okay. <laughs> I'm not saying there wasn't. I'm just You're saying, saying I was, a, I was thought. just surprised at this statement because the picture we get is that it's just rampant. Now, I, maybe yeah. Rome, I don't know. I mean, when you stand in Rome and you look at the Colosseum and you realize what occurred in there and you are of the faith, you know, it's a little bit different than someone who's not of the faith. But on the bullet point on the next page, it says the early church grew despite times of persecution. Mm -hmm. Right. How would you explain that? Holy Spirit. And I think early church, generally when I think of it, like it means like the first couple hundred years, you know, kind of like, so, I mean, because all the apostles, they were all killed. I mean, yeah. most of them were, were crucified and some, you know, so. That, and some of those books weren't even written until... Letters yeah. 60, 70, 90 <laughs> yeah. years later after Christ. So. I don't remember what happened to John. But the John on the island, and he had all those. Yeah. The author of yeah, John of Patmos, yeah. author of Revelation. Yeah. Revelation, was on this yeah. island. But and, that yeah. itself was like an yeah. exile. Yes. It wasn't, um, yeah. okay. not to, but I mean, I think there's more nuance than this. I think Yeah. it's kind of a little bit of both and and like. Through the later times, it, it, it changes. I think it's the, you know, it's the public going out. I mean, the, that those that were, you know, shouting and doing these large speeches that, like, like if it wasn't causing the difficulties for the Romans, they would they sort of find so when right. they did, you know. Yeah, that I can totally believe. If I can control your 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 way of thinking, I'm fine with it. Yeah. But if, you, if it gets to the point where you're starting to control me, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and then in context with just the two questions, that's what I was bumping it off against. Right. That because, I mean, we think of suffering today. I mean, now you do have some persons who would say Christians are persecuted in the United States. I would probably disagree with that. They might be. That's what they say. But, Christian but there are places in the world where Christians literally are being killed because they're Christian, and among other religious you know, things as well. So is Paul talking about both? Because we, we talk about suffering in our lives, and so... And some Still. Christians, like really <clears throat> the conservative right Christians, 
they're almost persecuting, you know, like LGBTQ or, you know, anybody who's different than them. So, so far. Although they'll say they're not persecuting anybody that the Bible is pointing and they're right, just following right, the right, Bible. Right. So far, none of us have been around it up quite yet, but there right. have been persons killed, mm -hmm. attacked. Mm -hmm. We've grown up with that. As a result of being LGBTQ, mm -hmm. but as a result of being LGBTQ I, and, yes. <laughs> and Christian, is that a special category? What? I don't think it's a special category. I made a comment last week, I think, when we were talking that, you know, I grew up in a time where you were so closeted. I mean, first of all, you never heard anything, so you had to go find your information if you even thought to find information. And then, so when you, when people were getting together, you know, we talked about parallel lives, parallel families, I was told that I could not be gay and Christian by some gay persons. And of course I was told by, well because since the, the many gay people had been so, I mean the church did the number on whatever. So they had wanted nothing to do with it. Many of them have come back to their own faith because it's much bigger than whatever. But so, but then Christians would say, in, if they even brought it up, the church, if you saw it, would say, well, you can't be gay and a Christian. So it's you, if you're gay, you're not a Christian. So the church told you, just the, you know, back and forth. And a gay person, some gay people, not all, because a lot of my friends are be religious, but they would just say, you know, uh, you can't be gay if you, you just can't be a Christian if you're gay. You can't be gay if you're a Christian. And I know. Too bad. We had this conversation well, like 10 I, years ago. What I, we I, were I, the men, probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Speeding but, through the streets. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> but it's just... <laughs> Well, and, and Gail, of course, I've experienced being told in the past that I can't possibly be a serious scientist and be a Christian at the same time. Oh, yes. Which, of I course, harms, I was told I couldn't both. be a scientist which, which, because you're just, a female. Okay. <laughs> just, my let, me, let me finish my thought. I'll, I'll be done in a second, I promise. Okay. Uh, which, of course, that harms both science and it harms the religious community because it gives fodder to the people to who berate Christianity because they say it's irrational and anti-science, et cetera, et cetera. And regarding LGBTQ, um, uh, from personal experience, I have a child who's almost 30 years old mm -hmm. who was persecuted all of his life because he happened to be born biologically female and was it it was clear from experience and from all the interactions that what he was experiencing was a was a real was not some psychological illusion but was a real mismatch between biology and gender identity and was persecuted by a lot of people who would consider themselves Christians for having a gender affirming surgery that I am convinced had he not had that, he'd be dead today because he could not have lived with the body that he was born with. So th this is one issue. There are a lot of issues that I'm happy to debate with other Christians and I'm very happy to move one way or the other a little bit on, but there are some things that I can't move one way or the other on because as the parent of a 30-year-old child who has been ostracized all their life and from the get-go, being biologically female but giving the appearance of being male was thrown out of the girl's bathroom, even though all the plumbing was female, simply because people didn't believe that at the time he was actually a she and then experienced the reverse. So what do you do when you're a person who is condemned for using 
any kind of a bathroom because there are people that will say you don't belong there. You know, I mean, this this is something that's just so horrific. And I'm sorry for going on about this. But, um, Gail, I, I believe that what you have experienced probably in your lifetime has been horrific. But what the trans community has experienced, I think, has been horrific on oh, an even entirely other level. And well, for I'm those people who are who are born who do not have either XX or XY chromosomes, but XXXY or some other combination that are not even clearly biologically male or female. These people are, exist and they can't just be swept under the rug. What do we do with them as Christians? How do we interpret that and how do we live other than by practicing the love of God and living Christ-like lives in the sense that we we love we love everyone and we don't persecute people for who they are i'm sorry i will now get off my soapbox i've said no, that. I, don't think you need to be sorry. I would agree with you grace because even way back when the gay community also persecuted trans in the sense that no one could figure out i'm using that as a general thing yeah not everyone did because we did have persons in our groups and in our friendships. But and, 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 and Jack knows that. It's been, yeah. all, it's been always there, and now it's even just become so much worse as a targeted scapegoat now. Yeah. So it's all related to where is God when we suffer? So right. it's amazing you're here at. This Bible study, this guy <laughs> must have been with you. <laughs> I, I think it's relevant if we look at the Lutheran context mm -hmm. section where, you know, as Lutherans, you don't believe that it's just this individualistic kind of relationship with God. And that's and the buck stops there. Like, no, it's, it's a community. Um, you want me to read number one? Yeah, you could, you could read, like, yeah, number one. Okay. Lutheran context. The Lutheran principle of public interpretation is helpful for reading and understanding the session scripture text. Lutherans believe that the Bible is meant to be read and interpreted in a public sphere rather than simply in private. In other words, Lutherans believe that God can speak to us individually, but we need the community to help us interpret God's message. Together, we can better hear and interpret God's universal message to all people, a message that can and must be applied to our individual experiences. Why might it be important to discuss the origin and meaning of suffering in public with other people? Other people have suffered in ways I can't even imagine. It's not all about you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then it says, write down what God's message to all people might be regarding suffering and compare your statement with others? Is the message one that others might hear from this text? What would you say, a message to all people regarding stuff? I have a question about studying the scriptures. So the, the men that study the Torah, are they doing that individually? Um, it's not in an ice, I mean, it's in community, it's not. Mm -hmm in isolation and um, midrash is it's a written practice and I would I would compare it like preaching where like you have people are preaching on things and that that's not what the text says it's you know, it's you know expanding on it mm -hmm. but that's kind of what midrash is it's and sometimes it's a lot of rabbis who they come together and they'll write a, a midrash on something, and it's you know it's basically an and interpretation of it. it. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I think that it, it, questioning is encouraged as well and yeah. challenging. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. In my mind, we we just did this in in church. We talked about the the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, and you know, mm -hmm. this guy you know read it. I'm sure there. I mean, I could read this a hundred times over and I wouldn't get it. Mm -hmm. 
And at some point in time, the spirit, you know, comes into you and says, this is what it means. Oh, well, now I get 1%. 1%. And I read it again, and now I get 2%. You know, it's, so I, I really don't, this, the Lutheran principles, I, I don't buy that at all. This is, again, someone saying something. I don't know where that comes where that's, it's a Lutheran principle that says you can't read it and understand it by yourself, but you have to have a bunch of people explaining it to you? I don't think it's saying that. It's helpful. I think what it's saying is that, you know, we are a part of a community and we we experience God together as, as a community and we come to read and understand together. Like it's It's not just that it's just me and God and and no one else like that. But is that different from any other Christian organization? I would think they're all basically in a community. But I think there is some that it's very individualistic. Not that you're not worshiping together in a church, but like worship is centered in such a way that it's like you and God and, and, and no one else. Your personal relationship, you're this, you're yeah. that, that whole thing growing up. And I think it's and I would say that not all places, not all Lutheran traditions, or not all, all Lutheran congregations themselves, in some ways, this congregation does publicly challenge and talk about difficult things and bring up things. It doesn't mean everyone agrees, and it doesn't mean you're not supposed to have your own individual devotions, but eventually. But unless this conversation had taken place, and if we're all home reading and interpreting ourselves, and we only have our filter and our sphere of reference, the grace has a different sphere. I have and you have. We all have different. Look at how many different yeah. seven opportunities right here of just, and I think that's the way things can only change or we can deal with suffering. It's kind of like when you listen to, like, when Jewish persons talk about the Holocaust and the trauma is, 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 they still talk about it in terms of that wound to that people. Even though there are people now, they're further and further away from that period. It's still a wound generationally to that people and to other persons and different kinds of things. Unless we're all talking, and interpreting what it means to love each other and what suffering means, how will we ever... I think that, I, I didn't know that was Lutheran, but I certainly feel that in this in this particular church that I can disagree. I mean, Bart, Dylan, we used to yell at each other back and forth because we just, you know, violently disagreed with each other's theology. But... You know, I heard her, and she heard me, and you know, and and, and we can. We're we're all different, and and this church allows us to be that way, which I really do think is exceptional. Well, and I don't think that we're, this is saying that all, that Lutherans are the only ones. That's I what guess. I thought it was saying. Yeah. I think we're just saying it's yeah. one of our principles as a Lutheran yeah, theology yeah, okay, body. Okay. And they say here too, yeah. in number two. Another Lutheran principle for reading and interpreting the scripture is asking the question, what shows forth Christ? Mm -hmm. Using this principle, we ask, what do we learn about the nature, role, and work of Christ from the text? So where do we find Christ in Romans 18 to 39? <coughs> All right. 18 to 39. The whole thing. The whole thing. That we were at. So, well, to me, certainly the Holy Spirit in us knows what we're thinking mm -hmm. and can pass that on to God such that God knows what we're thinking without us having to say the right words. I mean, there's no, oh, I have to say the purpose, perfect prayer, else God's not going to hear it. And then stuff. Which I think it goes back to that part where we got into that long conversation. Are you going to say the word? <laughs> where we were talking about that's where we see Christ. It's that God, you know, wants people to love 
God, Jesus came, did his, this work, his work, where it rose. What does it mean now to love God? It means to be like Christ. It means to empty oneself, to be like Christ, to um, be the hands and feet of God in the world, which is love. And that's where I see Christ in the suffering too, because when, what do we do when we see suffering? Do we walk by or do we, you know, Goes back to that who is a neighbor question. Wasn't yeah. that the start of the uh, this whole year? Yeah. Was you yeah. guys remember yeah. Steve Weising? I yeah. wasn't here for Steve. You were Steve. So. I, was. I just, I just one thing Steve always used to talk about is the church and how we can support each other. He said, "We're all weebles. Weebles wobble, but we don't fall." It's like you know, yeah. if I bounce in, she's <laughs> gonna bounce yeah. back at me and, and and push me back upright, and we're all pushing each other upright, and that's one of the good things about church. I just thought that was a wonderful little analogy yeah. that I remember 20 years later. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that little last, that famous verse, how nothing can separate us from right. the love of God, I mean, that's like a powerful thing, because no matter what's happening to you, or mm -hmm. you're covered. <laughs> and it also means that word divorce, which has more of a choice factor, or more of a whatever, well, separate can also be can also mean to divorce, that mm -hmm. word, to divorce. So nothing, nothing. It's not even by, you know, your own desire. To but predestination. Well, that's true. If you wanted, that. if you, even if you wanted to, you can't separate yourself. Except no, you can't you. divorce yourself from God because God's not divorcing you. But that also <laughs> implies, uh, sorry, that, that goes yeah. back to the P word. That goes back to saying, you were married to begin with, and and if there is a if you're the if the p word is true in the old classical sense, you were never there to begin with. So God's not separating; He never joined. It's really it's a hard theology. God, but nothing can divorce believers from God's love. Now they do make it God's love and believers. Yeah. I mean, you're obviously still believing. So. Yeah. Yeah, so. I know. I know. I know. But scripture that, will say that if once you are God's, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will not be let go. There's nothing you can do to be let go. But again, that's if. And I, I it's a scary theology. You know, you said Calvin was unsure of himself. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, Except the sin against the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And well, I that's used, the bad one. And I used to say. Well, how will you know? And somebody says, if you keep asking the question, it means you haven't sinned against the Holy Spirit because you won't care. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, I, I heard the same thing, Gail. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, did you have the color book? <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> but yeah, that, that one was one that bothered me for a while. It was like, how would I know if I know? Yeah. I had a professor who's like, that's why, you know, people say, like, a, like, a swear with either Jesus or God, but never like, the Holy Spirit. Oh, um, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. They like, would God say that. It, but they never say, like, yeah, you know, Holy Spirit. Because that's the last thing I get. So, the Holy Spirit got short shrift. Yeah. Yeah. Because they think, you know. Oh, that's. It's very interesting. And the Holy Spirit got short shrift a lot anyway, so. <laughs> so. Yeah, we talk a lot about that. That's something that um, some of the more evangelical traditions highlight more of the yeah. cost of African tradition. Yeah. You know, liberator, a lot of spiritual, a lot of spirit. Yeah. Including their ancestors. Well, isn't the Holy Spirit? Supposedly more feminine than the, you know, you oh, know, for sure she is. Yeah. Or, you know, for sure she is. Yeah. You notice that's tripping over I forget what the <laughs> other words are. Ruha, Ru, Ruach, Ruach, Ruach. That's a feminine word. That's a feminine Hebrew yeah. word. Um, and even some of the, because actually in the Hebrew Bible, there's you know, multiple words for God. We, they're always translated as God. And some are, are um, 
feminine words. They're not all masculine words. Yeah. But Especially get that multiplicity. I was wondering, I mean, I know there's a number of places in Scripture where it talks about my interpretation, but, you know, men stupid, women are on a higher pedestal. They are, <laughs> they're the wisdom. They're the, I think wisdom is used over and over. Yeah, again. I think wisdom is. And, and um, you know, and, and spirit is kind of a, I'm giving you wisdom. I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, so it's, I can see a relationship that way. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to go over? Yeah. Anybody have any other thoughts? Yeah, two hours just left to go over. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah this is better enough time this. for this. Uh, yeah. And how we. I like how it says, how do you react to Paul's idea that even when we are unable to pray, the spirit takes over with sighs too yes. deep for words? Oh, yeah. Thank God. Mm-hmm. I agree. Hmm. In our days, I just, I don't even know how to put it in words. Yeah. So. I like this creation image of groaning and labor pains. Yeah, I love that. That That's a, a, a very good image, I think. Human yeah. creation? The image of creation, all the same. Earlier on, grows. Come here, think about the image of creation. 822. Verse 22. Pulling in that environment. The environment was never left out. Yeah. I wonder if that would be true for Adam and Eve. No. They were they were the only ones that were kind of sort of or Adam really, you know, if you you know biblically, Adam would, would be would be the only one that was that was born without sin. And a, a, any birth after that, any human birth after that, uh, was supposed to be painful. Well, after they found it, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. After they chose to, and the um, mess up. the um, the creation that I just heard someone talking, you know, in John, it's in, in English. It's translated, you know, for God so loved the world. That, and we have this mm-hmm. conception of Earth, but really, the word means cosmos. Mm-hmm. So it's. God so loved everything. It's every every the larger you know everything that is, yeah. Yeah. not just that's again the way I think it's thought about. Because what often when we, I think people read that and stuff, it's like us. We're the world. It's human mm-hmm. beings. But no, it's, no, it's beyond. It's it's every yes. John and as an astrophysicist who has been at least peripherally part of the more than foul. 5,000 exoplanets that have already been observed orbiting other stars, many of which look like they may be habitable. Believe me, cosmos is is an important part of the way I view things. Would, 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 the, would the next question, or wouldn't the next question be if cosmos is God, so God so loved the cosmos that he sent Jesus to this planet, that would imply that Jesus is still the way for everyone in the cosmos? Brian, that has been debated by theologians for hundreds of years. That's, that's um, you know, whether, whether one incarnation or multiple incarnations are the way to go. I work closely with Ted Peters, who's a Lutheran theologian, um, who's written extensively on what he calls astrotheology and astroethics. Um, and this is actually a big a big question, what the incarnation actually means, um, who it's for, and whether it needs to happen more than once. I mean, that's that's one of those, I mean, how many questions in theology could actually be considered settled questions? John, yeah. you probably know more, more, more than any of us, I, and I'm sorry, forgive me, John, I probably know you least well of all. I'm Grace Wolf Chase. Uh, you may or may not know I, that, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> yes, I, I am an astronomer by profession. I assume you are a theology student or a theologian or a, um, are, are, are you studying at the LSTC right now or have um, you or? I got a uh, MA um, from Duke Divinity School. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, so, and I don't claim to be an expert on this. I've just had 
conversations with theologians on this topic for more than 20 years now. So I've, I've had a lot of discussions. Yeah. Oh, good, good that we're not alone. Oh, well, <laughs> well, even yeah. if you just thought your theology was right and never discussed it with anybody else, then, you know what I mean? You could just yeah. be all clear and set in your ways, and this is the way I'm thinking, and then... The problem is when your neighbor is thinking totally different. Yeah. And, uh, and you don't go back and say, you know, you're wrong because you just, you just, oh, it's interesting. Right. You tell I mean, me about what you're Because really, what can you prove? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't have, I, um, and I think that's what theology is. It's supposed to be like this contemplative thing that is an act of, of worship. It's not supposed to be, I think, the a conversation stopper, but a conversation starter, and it, it's it's a way to worship God. Well, well it's a way to grow in your faith and think about, you know what I mean? The more yeah. you know, the less you know, kind of. Yes, yes, it's yes, been yes, my yes, experience. Yes. Absolutely. Here, here's a, a beautiful analogy that I found. Um, the growth of our, our knowledge is like an island. As the island of our knowledge grows, so do the shores of our ignorance. Yes. So that's one way to think about it, one one metaphor. Yeah, I listened to a podcast called Co The Cosmic We, and it's interesting because I didn't know this when I started, and it's a con contemplative kind of thing, but it's Dr. Donnie Bryant is one of the co-sponsors, and it turns out he's a graduate pastor from Luther Seminary. Oh, really? in Minnesota, which was surprising. Now, he's also doing something different now. I mean, he moved on to do things. And then this uh, Dr. Barbara Holmes, and it's just taking the cosmos, but also all of those, how we show up in the world, but how we, you know, getting past all the things that keep us from connecting. And it's just, it's fact, and they have different people come on and speak and talk, and Richard Moore was on at one point, and then just different, yeah. and it's just interesting, because it throws out different ideas. It's not, you know, you don't have to agree or disagree. It's, it's not a, it's not a debate. It's yeah. just. How are we wired? It seems that we're wired. Yeah. To recognize the, the differences between us instead of recognizing the similarities between mm -hmm. us. And why is that? You know, I mean, we've got so many things that we're similar in, and yet we recognize the opposite. It's weird. Are we Boy, Brian, that is a $1 million question, I think. <laughs> is that it? Come on. <laughs> That's 99.9% the same? Yeah. Like, yeah. Right. And even, I think, we should, I think it's scriptural too when Paul talks about right. it. it's one body with many members. I mean, right. That's one of my favorite things is because, yeah, we should recognize our difference. That doesn't mean you persecute or right. anything like right. that. You don't have to. You're do all members of, of the body. You all are. You celebrate the difference. You, yeah. 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 Um, but when you want power, then you sometimes need to begin to focus on the differences so you can scapegoat. So now you can keep, because now you have to have a hierarchy in the whole bit, and so we just have gotten ourselves in such a big mess, and that's kind of what we, I think we're all trying to work toward is, on different ways, we say it differently, is how do we bring God's kingdom here? I, I also love the phrase, I can't remember exactly where this is from, but where two or three of you are gathered, there I am in your midst. Yeah. A, again, underscoring community mm -hmm. and discussion and those connections as being part of the whole process of connecting with God. Yeah. Well, um, I know we went a little bit over Time. because the conversation was so good. Yeah, we, yeah, we always go over um, So I'll just uh, say a prayer. Okay. Um, the God of the cosmos, we boldly proclaim, what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? In the midst of life's suffering, you are there. In the midst of confusion and questioning, you are there. 
Help us understand that we are never alone and your love is greater than any of our pains. Let this be our guide and our stronghold. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, 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 Thanks for the great discussions. Yeah.